and given it is armistice today, tomorrow, we've heard some very silly nonsense on a number of channels with some very silly reactions about the idea that there were no black service men in World War One or Two. Um, this is something that needs to be, shall we say, debunked, to coin a phrase. Let's share a screen or two. This is Paul Vod Leto Vorbeck, also known as the Line of Africa. He's also the man who infamously told Hitler to fuck himself. Can't be, can't be all bad, no matter what else he did. He was one of Germany's most prestigious and well-respected generals during and after World War I, which is probably why he survived telling Hitler to go and fuck himself. With the outbreak of the First World War, the colonial territories of the warring empires were just as much a part of their conflict as their European counterparts, though far from the trenches of the mud. This general, by the way, is famous as one of the greatest exponents of guerrilla warfare on a large scale you'll ever find in history. Hopefully outnumbered and outgunned, the Imperial German Schutztruppe Protection Force of East Africa had a single ace up their sleeve, the leadership of Paul van Leto Vorbeck, a man soon to be known as the Lion of Africa. He waged perhaps the most effective guerrilla campaign of the early 20th century and held his respective friend, foe, and even the colonial soldiers under his command. Returning from the war, a hero who would be remembered as one of the most well-respected commanders of the era, so popular and influential that even during the late reign of the Nazis, he was able to insult Hitler's to his face. How sad for Hitler. Refuse any positions offered by the regime and survive their reign of terror with his popularity and honor intact. This is quite a lengthy kind of summary of his like career. Before the line of Africa, the cup of Prussia, and it goes through it and tells you how he was born in 18... 18- 17 to minor of Prussian nobility, etc., etc. A standard sort of background for the day, served in China in the Boxer Rebellion, etc., etc., etc. Then we get to the Great War in Africa, where he commanded a very large number of German Ascari at one point. With the outbreak of war in 1914, it was immediately clear that the chances for a German victory in Africa were slim to none. The largest concentration of Schutztruppe, made up of European volunteers and enlisted African Ascari, was in East Africa and consisted of around 2,700 soldiers. Facing at the, um, at the outbreak of war was a mix of British, Belgian and Portuguese colonial soldiers, all made up of a majority of African enlisted soldiers with smaller amounts of Europeans. So straight away you can see you've got black troops commanded by a minority of white officers and probably senior NCOs on both sides. While the Schutz troop were better at trade than the intent counterparts, all parties faced similar issues. None of the armies were trained in open warfare. Most were using heavily outdated or even obsolete equipment, having been intended as counterinsurgent or security forces for the colonial occupiers. Worse still for Germany was the issue of resupply and reinforcements. As hostilities commenced, a naval blockade was almost immediately established around Germany, making any attempts to resupply from Europe impossible. During the entirety of the war, only two merchant ships were able to make it to the German colonies. While further arms and man came from the Scottel SMS Konigsberg, you're going to get some of my wonderful mispronunciations of German and French in here. Any Germans listening are entitled to sit in here a note saying... I'm mutilating their language, and I shall apologise. The Scuttlegraft's guns were stripped from the ship and repurposed for land use. I'm going to summarise as we go on. At its height, the Such troop consisted of roughly 80,000 soldiers and 12,000 local mercenaries, compared to a total of roughly 250,000 intent soldiers, with both sides who are having even more port- porters who were essential to warfare in Africa. So... That's only a small number of soldiers, isn't it? Hardly any at all. No, no black people then in World War I. Now, what made this general so famous was the fact that he held off far greater sort of British forces and managed to launch raids into neighbouring British hell regions. And this made him a hero after World War I. And a hero was hugely respected in Germany and hugely idealised almost, which is why he was able to get away with telling Hitler to go and F himself. 
I'm going to put this article up so you can read about him because he's a fascinating figure. But let's go on to some more black uh, figures from World War I because there are more and it wouldn't be right to just sort of pretend there weren't. Here we have Senegalese sailor, um, soldiers from World War I, the Senegalese, and it's going to be more mispronunciation times, Tirelios, the forgotten infantrymen of World War II. My father served with the 808 tank destroyer battalion during the war. This photo was among his possessions. It shows several German soldiers, what I believe are Senegalese Tirelios prisoners of war. Can you confirm that? Did many Senegalese Trillias fight during the war and how are they treated as prisoners? James Whitlinger, Allison Park, Pennsylvania. The person answering it notes that they were colonial light infantrymen. During World War II, the French recruited 179,000 of these. Some 40,000 were deployed to Western Europe. Many were sent to bolter the French Maginot Line. As prisoners of war, they fared poorly. Well, that's not surprising, is it, considering the, the ubermensch outlook of the Germans. However, they don't seem to exist for the uh, sort of views of uh, some figures who would seem to think no black people served in World War II, and they're just to be mocked, and we'd ha be treated to silly comments about how they couldn't get up in the morning or arrive on time, etc., etc., which is highly disrespectful. And finally, we have the King's African Rifles and East African Forces Association. And believe me, there are quite a few more groups I can find. I don't mean to slight any other groups like the from any other armies. I've just picked these three to start with just to make a point. So anybody else who feels that you'd like to chuck me a link, feel free and I'll do a, a presentation on you. The King's African Rifles, again, you get a, a little history of them. Let's wait for the page to change. It's a bit slow, this site, for some reason. It tells you their roots. It tells you how the roots of the regiment originate with the clashes with Arab slave traders and warlike native traders. It tells you about the wars they were involved in, the Ashanti, the Mad Mullah, which <laughs> I'm not sure we should be... <laughs> it's a rather wonderfully politically incorrect term for that war, although it is still generally used. And then the Great War which involved the, the King's African Rifles rising to a strength of about 35,000, of whom 11% were Europeans, so the other 89% most certainly were not. Casualties were 8,225. So that's including 22.6% of the officers, which is a very high casualty rate. It also notices the large number of porters involved, as with the Senegalese, and then it goes on to notice the Second World War and talks about campaigns in Abyssinia, Madagascar, Burma, Malaya, and later Mau Mau. That's three examples I found with minimal research, and I knew about them to some degree already, I'll admit. But when we hear people talking about silly nonsense the day before Armistice Day about black people in a way that mocks their participation in the war and mocks them as soldiers. This is not how you remember those who served their country and who fought. It is highly disrespectful. And those doing it need to think about what they're doing and stop it.